Hi, everyone. Welcome to our BYOT Virtual Candlewick Library Preview. My name is Salako Shiroda, and I'm the Manager of Library Marketing at Candlewick Press. And I'm joined by my excellent colleague, Dana Eager. We're so excited to be able to give you a sneak peek of our newest titles for Spring 22 today. Um, we're going to be talking all about early readers, middle grade, and YA books. And we've also invited two very special guest speakers today. We'll first hear from award-winning and best-selling YA author, Nancy Worlin, who's here to tell us all about her first story for middle grade readers, Healer and Witch, that tackles traditional fantasy tropes. And then we'll move on to our staff presentation of some of our other titles to note for the upcoming season. And then we'll end the preview with our closing speaker today, Christina Suntornvat, this year's two-time Newbery Honor winner for A Wish in the Dark and also Teen, will give us an insider look at her much anticipated new middle grade novel, The Last Mapmaker. It's such a treat to get to chat with them about their work in this way. We hope you can stick, stick around till the end. It'll be definitely worth it. If you find it useful, feel free to follow along to the Edelweiss catalog with all of the titles in order of presentation. With, with the link that I'm dropping into the chat now. So I hope you can see that. And then there's also a Q&A feature. So feel free to submit any specific questions for us or to our guest speakers through the Q&A box below. And we'll try to answer as many as we can. And if you're having any technical difficulties, not to worry, we'll be distributing the link to the archive recording of this event later on. So you won't miss a thing. All right, let's get started. Grab your cuppa. Here's mine. And we'll spill the tea. Um, awesome. So first of all, I am so excited to introduce our first author, Nancy Worland. She is the author of 11 books for teens, including Candlewick's Zoe Rosenthal is Not Lawful Good, in which a buttoned up overachiever works overtime to keep her inner nerd at bay and fails spectacularly, um, which came out this year and we love so much. And of course, she is also the author of the National Book Award finalist, The Rules of Survival the Edgar Award winner, The Killer's Cousin, and the New York Times bestseller, Impossible. Nancy Worland is local to us. She lives near us here in Boston, and we are so excited to be publishing her middle grade debut this spring, Healer and Witch. It is a historical fantasy perfect for fans of Kelly Barnhill and Delia Sherman. It's a novel um, about a powerful story of family, gender, agency, and strength, but I will let Nancy tell you more about it and give you a sneak peek reading. So take it away, Nancy. Thanks so much, Dana and Sawako, and I'm so thrilled to see all of you here. Um, Killer and Witch is indeed my debut middle grade novel, but the secret information is that I first drafted this book 25 years ago. Um, if you know my work, you'll know that I have normally been known for writing young adult fiction, but middle grade historical books, and particularly with a touch of magic or fantasy, was always my first love. And 25 years ago, after publishing my first novel, I drafted the book that would become Healer and Witch. And I have to say that it was one of the happiest writing experiences of my entire life. Um, I remember at one point writing longhand on this book in the reading room of the New York Public Library before an American Library Association conference that I was attending and feeling almost like I wanted to fly through the streets of New York. I was so happy in the writing and so in love with my main character, Sylvie. But the timing was off for me. My publisher at that time wanted me to pursue YA and I was young enough to think I'd just better do what people want. Then the pandemic happened. I didn't feel like I could write anything at all. And I turned to my filing cabinet and pulled out and I only had a, a, a printed copy, Healer and Witch and read it again and fell in love with it all over again and began working on it all over again. And then was fortunate enough that my editor at Candlewick, Miriam Newman, also loved the story and wanted to publish it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it and then I'm gonna read. Um, and we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So this story takes place in the year 1531. As the excerpt I'm about to read begins, 
you will find us in the market of a medium-sized French town with Sylvie, who is 15 years old, and here's a marketplace for you to set the mood, and her eight-year-old companion, Martin, who has followed her from their home village. They're strangers to this town. They come from a small village. It's all strange to them. And here in the market, Martin has just encountered a very haughty, rich young man who he instinctively does not like. The haughty young man was moving on, but Martin's eyes flared, his hands fisted. Sylvie stepped forward hastily and grabbed one of them. She held it firmly. Martin, she said, I suppose we could afford a pastry. Shall we get one and share it? Martin tore his resentful gaze from the blue surcoat as it disappeared into the market throng. He nodded stiffly. Relieved, Sylvie tugged him in the opposite direction. She would need to speak to Martin later about the importance of controlling his temper. Later would be soon enough, of course. As Martin finished his last buttery bit of pastry, a boy selling eggs reached out and touched his red hair. It means you're good luck, he said, or it means you're a troublemaker. Which? Martin laughed, fully himself again. Troublemaker, he caroled, dancing away backward, as heedless as before. Me too, said the egg boy. He grabbed up a precious goose egg, took a few backward steps of his own, and held up the egg, poised. Catch it if you can, he called to Martin and let fly. Martin leaped into the air and snatched the egg, whole, out of the air. He held it up delicately between his fingers, the fingers that could snatch a fish live from the water. Around them in the plaza, people burst into scattered applause and laughter. Martin bowed deeply. Then he rose and suddenly and unexpectedly, he lobbed the egg back toward the egg boy. The egg boy ducked which wasn't necessary because the egg sailed an easy 10 inches above where his head had been to land with a smart crack on the front of a certain richly embroidered blue surcoat. Sylvie clapped a hand to her mouth. Everyone but the chickens and pigs stared as the thick yellow yolk of the goose egg slithered its way downward and petered here and there by pieces of eggshell and now ruined threads of embroidery. Sylvie thought she saw a flicker of emotion on the young man's face. Shame or, but it couldn't be, amusement? But she must have been mistaken because no, his face was a cool mask and he did not so much as look down at the egg. Instead, he sent a single long comprehensive glance around the market, seeming to take note of every person present. Sylvie thought that he should not have been able to dom dominate the crowd with such a glance. Surely he was not more than six or seven years older than she was. Finally, his gaze settled inevitably and unerringly on Martin. You, said the young man. One would have had to know Martin as well as Sylvie to interpret the tilt of his chin as anything but insolence. Sylvie braced herself, trying to think of something to do and failing. Trouble, moaned the egg boy under his breath. Without moving his eyes from Martin's face, the man said, who is responsible for this small boy? For all that it carried, his voice was level. It was only a few steps to Martin's side. Sylvie took them. She felt the young man's gaze weigh her and find her wanting. She raised her chin. He's my brother, she said to the rich young man. It was an accident. She sneaked a look at the still dripping yolk. It had nearly reached the man's waist. The stain would never come out. Good. Indeed, he's sorry, she said. She put a pleading note in her voice, even though she hated doing it. The young man's brow lifted in mocking disbelief, while Martin said nothing. Very sorry, Sylvie insisted. Beneath her skirt, she trod viciously on Martin's toes. Martin? Martin muttered something inaudible that might perhaps have passed for an apology, but probably not. And Sylvie spared a moment to reflect that if this horrible young man failed to murder Martin, she herself could do it later with her bare hands. Time stretched. At last, the young man strolled forward, 
booted foot by booted foot. The heavy leather boots stopped in front of Martin, but their occupant looked down on both of them, though Sylvie was grown as tall as any woman. He reached into his pocket and pulled out an exquisite silk handkerchief. He squatted in front of them with the grace of perfect physical control. Sylvie found she hated him for that too, and held out the handkerchief to Martin. Wipe it up, boy, he said. There was no expression on his face at all, no clue to his thoughts, just the stillness. And I'll close there. This is a favorite scene of mine because this is where you meet, you've already met in the story thus far, uh, Sylvie and Martin, but this is where you meet the third most important actor in the story, um, this young man whose name I will not reveal. And then a fourth will join us in a bit. Um, so I'm hoping that people will have questions. Yes, I was just about to say thank you so much, Nancy, for that lovely reading. Um, and yes, let's take it over to some questions now. Um, sorry, I say there, there is a long question from Donna. Um, Nancy, it sounds like finishing Healer and Witch has helped you through the pandemic and started a new track for you into middle grade lit. Do you see yourself continuing in middle grade? Um, a sequel, perhaps? <laughs> um, I'm so glad you asked that question, Donna. Um, the answer is yes. Um, you see this beautiful background that I have here. I'm at the Highlights Foundation on a writing retreat, and I am getting close to finishing a first draft of what I think is another uh, middle grade historical. Um, no magic in this one, um, but kind of a fairy tale feel nonetheless. And again, I am having, I love writing this stuff. I love it more than I ever loved writing YA. Um, and so I do see myself in the future writing more middle grade. Um, wow, well, that's very exciting to hear, definitely. Um, and Sharon also asks, how much research did you have to do for this historical book? It's an interesting question for me because the research is bifurcated. There's the research that I remember from 25 years ago, which was extensive. Um, I read a lot about witchcraft in medieval Europe. Um, I read a lot about herbalism and healing and, and women as healers. Uh, I had a giant map of France which I tacked up on the wall so that I could have the journey that Sylvie and Martin were going to take. Um, and I knew so much that when I came again to read my draft of this novel during the pandemic, I thought, how did I know all of this? And do I have to go back now and check it all again or can I trust my past self? Um, I'm happy to say that largely I could trust my past self and where I couldn't, my editor stepped in. She has a minor in medieval history. Oh, yes, that is helpful. Um, well, that sort of goes along with this question too. Why did you choose the year 1531? Um, I wanted to be right on the edge of medieval Europe in the beginning of the Renaissance. Um, I wanted the world to be opening up the way that it did during the Renaissance. Um, and I also needed a time, um, well, you could say that all times in history are, are dangerous for women, um, but I needed a time of particular danger. Um, and this was one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's definitely a great setting for this story. And I'm so, again, I'm so happy to hear that you'll be writing more middle grade because I personally love middle grade too. And Ellen asks, what attracts you to writing middle grade as opposed to YA? That's another great question and the big surprise for me, and Ellen might know this as well as a middle grade writer herself, I feel unleashed as a writer in writing middle grade. Um, I feel when writing YA that I am very confined, particularly since I normally write contemporary YA, to what my teenage character knows about the world and about him or herself. In a way, I did not feel confined writing about younger characters. Even on the level of vocabulary, I felt free to use the full range of, of the vocabulary that I know and love. I don't quite understand it. I'll be interested to talk to other people about this. Um, 
That is interesting. <laughs> no, bigger. Yeah, that's bigger awesome. Bigger world in, in middle grade. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I think it's a really interesting time to be in and to write about for sure. Um, did, well, this sort of is, this, I feel like this is along the same lines, but Summer wonders, uh, your middle grade voice sounds on point. Did you find it difficult to alter the tone for a younger audience after so many YA novels? But it sounds like maybe that was actually beneficial for you. <laughs> it, it really was. Um, I feel as if late adolescence for teenagers is maybe a time of such self-absorption Whereas your younger, younger readers um, are looking about the world a little bit more. And maybe that's why things felt a little more open for me with middle grade. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Um, so Hella um, asks, thanks so well, thanks so much for the preview. Thank you for being here. Um, and she looks forward to reading your book. Since you first drafted this 25 years ago, did you find that your writing style or voice had changed over that time? Here's the remarkable thing. When writing middle grade, my voice is the same as it was 25 years ago, but it is, I feel a very different voice from the one that I use for YA. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a voice that at its deep, deepest level, I have to say feels much more like me, like Nancy. Um, it's kind of wonderful this far into a, a writing life to discover that I have other parts of me to explore that I hadn't, hadn't explored before or hadn't explored fully. It's wonderful. Um, I feel yeah. so lucky. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Tony asks, how much do you identify with Sylvie? Oh, Sylvie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I identify her with her quite a bit in some places and not a lot in others. Um, there is a point toward the beginning of the story, so it's not a spoiler, where Sylvie has set off alone from her village. She has a reason to run away from home, uh, a good reason, a, a scary reason. And then she hears someone coming behind her, and at first she's frightened, but then she turns and it's eight-year-old Martin from her village who refuses to leave her. And she is full of annoyance at him because he ought to go home and mm -hmm. enormous relief that she's not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think as a writer, I didn't want her to set off alone on this, this journey to find her deepest self. I wanted her to have companions. And that's how I feel about life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I and feel it's you always are good better to off have... with your friends and your loved ones nearby. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and I think we could all really relate to that, especially, you know, after the past couple years. Um, all right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, what do you hope young readers will take away from reading this book? What I really want for young readers is entertainment to be taken into another world for the period when they're reading the book and to find a friend within that book and things that they want to think about. And a little, I'll just use the word, a little escape from real life for a while. Mm -hmm. um, we've all been through and are still going through this pandemic and the world can be a frightening place and is a frightening place in many ways right now. Books are friends to me there are other places to go to be both apart from myself and also sometimes deeper into myself. And it would be an honor and a privilege if one of my books, if this book could do that, even for one reader, you, you give a book to the world, you, you send it away and then it's on its own and, and hopefully it will find the reader or readers who need it. And I, think I, it, I hope that happens. I think it definitely will. Um, because it is so wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much, Nancy, for being here and talking to us about Healer and Witch. And I can't wait for everyone to get the chance to read the whole thing. My very great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> and thank you so much, Nancy. That was so wonderful to get to hear about your debut middle grade up close. 
I think this book will be perfect for any classic middle grade fantasy lovers out there. And I love what she said about how she feels unleashed as a middle grade writer, like that it must be such an amazing feeling. Um, and you can definitely see the results of it in this amazing new title. So everyone make sure you go on Edelweiss to request an e-galley e of Healer and Witch and look out for the release of this title next March. We're all sending a virtual round of applause, Nancy. Thank you again, and we'll see you in a little bit. All right, so now it looks like it's time to move on to our staff presentation, and then we'll go on to our closing speaker, Christina Sintorvat. So just quickly before we dive in, we highly encourage you to tune into our second season of the popular Black Creator Series, which is an educator-focused conversation series that highlights the work of Black authors and illustrator, illustrators led by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul. For a full schedule and more information, please go to blackcreatorseries.candlelight.com. And if you're looking for something to read during Banned Books Week, make sure to check out You Can't Say That, Writers for Young People Talk About Censorship, free expression, and the stories that they have to tell, edited by one of the world's leading scholars on the children's books that um, are written by many um, leading scholars, uh, leading children's book authors, Leonard Marcus, uh, prompted by Marcus's insightful questions, 13 top children's and young adult authors speak out about what it's like to have your own work banned or challenged in America today. And be sure to join us for our next Candlewick All Class Read Along on Twitter. This is a weekly slow chat with Boston literacy and educa uh, literacy activists and educators, Nicole Montgomery and Dr. Kim Parker about Somebody Give This Heart a Pen by acclaimed performance poet, Sophia Thacker. Be sure to tune in. And we're also so excited to announce that we're newly publishing the beloved Anna Hibiscus, the Nigerian storyteller Asanuke's debut book for children and its sequels illustrated by Lauren Tobia. We're so delighted to be able to offer this along with other celebrated SNK stories. And we also have a brand new Stink book in the Stink Moody series by Megan McDonald. We do have a Judy and Stink turkey trot activity sheet uh, if you're interested in hosting a fun themed run this Thanksgiving. Um, obviously, you know, we encourage you guys to host these events around your institutional health guidelines, but we wanted to just offer this information because uh, we have uh, this new resource uh, with new prize information there. And then as for conferences, we'll be at uh, SLJ Day of Dialogue next. So make sure you register for this free online conference. <clears throat> Excuse me. Illustrator Jamie Kim will be on a panel to discuss her gorgeous new picture book, Mommy's Hometown. And Rajni Laraka will be speaking on a picture of a panel about I'll go and come back. So be sure to tune in. And this year's Margaret A. Edwards Award winner, Kekla Magoon, will be keynoting at ASL. And she'll be talking all about her brilliant new YA nonfiction, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Power to the People, that recontextualizes the history of the Panthers. It's also this year's National Book Award long list title. So we're really excited about that. And don't forget, we're very active on social media. So be sure to follow us on, at, on all of the channels um, listed here. And uh, if you're posting during this preview with hashtag uh, Candlewick Preview, make sure you let us know what you're most excited about. We'd love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to all of our library e-newsletters, uh, uh, our library newsletter and all the other offerings that we have for e-newsletters here. Um, you know, you can stay up to date on all of the new digital resources information, recent releases, author interviews, and more uh, if you're subscribed. And you can also access our Fall 21 lookbook with the QR code uh, here to the top, uh, right bottom. It offers a bird's eye view of the current list along with a series of fun author videos. All right, let's move on to the title presentations. First, we have Book Buddies. Marco Polo, Brave Explorer by Cynthia Lord, author of award-winning middle grade fiction titles such as the Newbery Honor Book, Rules. And it's illustrated by author illustrator of Little Fox in the Forest and the illustrator of many other picture books, Stephanie Gregan. From these superstar duo comes a fun illustrated chapter book series inspired by the existing Book Buddies program uh, at libraries and schools and bookstores that pairs little toys to be borrowed by children who need them. The second book of the series features Marco Polo, who is a retired Christmas ornament, but in his mind, he's a great mouse explorer. Because he's tiny and likely to be lost, he is the least borrowed of the book buddies. 
but he finally meets the right match in Seth, a boy who's about to attend his first sleepover. If Seth were to bring the stuffed bunny he actually sleeps with every night, uh, he'd risk being teased, but Marco Polo is the perfect size to hide away in a sleeping bag. This book explores common fears and quiet bravery and will leave readers eager for the next episode in the series. It's a fresh, friendly, and completely snark-free take on the classic kids genre of the secret lives of toys. And if you haven't checked out already, you know, don't forget the first book of the series, Ivy Lost and Found. It's about a lonely doll who helps a child adjust to a blended family. You won't want to miss it. And then next we have A Dragon Used to Live Here by Annette LeBlanc Kate, author, illustrator of The Magic Rabbit, and a cyber honor book, Look Up, Bird Watching in Your Own Backyard. This is a medieval inspired illustrated novel that blends the best of classic heroes tales with modern wit and humor in a story within a story format. Noble children, Thomas and Emily have always known their mother to be a sensible person, the lady of the castle. That is until they discover Meg, a cranky scribe who lives in a castle basement, leading a quirky group of artists and producing party invitations and other missives for the nobles above. Meg claims that she was a friend of their mother's back when they were kids, even before the dragon lives in the castle. Wait, a dragon? Not sure they can believe Meg's tales. The kids return again and again to hear the evolving fantastical stories of their mother's escapades while putting their fussiest penmanship to work and get caught up in a quest to reunite the one-time friends. This is a multi-layered story that blends medieval tropes that uh, and modern sensibility in a satisfying read for the whole, whole family. Great for real owls uh, for ages seven to nine, a dragon used to live here coming out next April. And next up we have Cress Watercress. In this lavishly illustrated woodland tale with a classic but modern sensibility, Gregory Maguire, who is of course the author of the wildly popular books in the Wicked, Wicked Years series, as well as the Boston Globe Hornbook Award honoree Egg and Spoon, he turns his trademark wit and wisdom to an animal adventure about growing up, moving on, and finding community. When Papa doesn't return from a nocturnal honey gathering expedition, Cress holds out hope, but her mother assumes the worst. It's a dangerous world for rabbits after all. Mama moves what's left of the Watercress family to the basement unit of the Broken Arms, a rundown apartment oak with a sus suspect <laughs> owl landlord, um, a nosy mouse super, a rowdy family of squirrels, and a pair of songbirds who broadcast everyone's business. Can a dead tree full of annoying neighbors and no papa ever be home? In this timeless spirit of E.B. White and the Wind in the Willows, yet thoroughly of its time, this read aloud and read alone gem for animal lovers of all ages features an unforgettable cast that leaps off the page in these glowing illustrations by David Litchfield, which are really just so gorgeous. So you won't wanna miss this new book, um, Cress Watercress. And next, I am so excited to introduce The Patron Thief of Bread. It's a new upper middle grade from the acclaimed author of Hour of the Bees and Race to the Bottom of the Sea, Lindsay Eager. It's a beautifully crafted, fast paced tale that will sure, be sure to delight fans of The Midwife's Apprentice and The Girl Who Drank the Moon and other books like that. It's set in medieval France with a Gothic backdrop. Think Hunchback of Notre Dame. An eight year old orphan girl duck is part of a roving band of street urchins who call themselves the Crowns. They're always thieving and always on the run. That is until they infiltrate an abandoned cathedral in the city of Odierne. It's all part of the bold new plan hatched by the Crown's fearless leader, Nat. One of their very own will pose as an apprentice to the local baker, relieving Master Griselde of bread and coin to fill the bellies and line the pockets of all the crowns. But no sooner is Duck apprenticed to the kindly Griselde, kindly Griselde than Duck's allegiances start to blur. Who is she really, a crown or an apprentice baker? And who does she want to be? It's told in alternating viewpoints and is an exquisite novel that evokes a timeless tale of love and self-discovery. And about the book, Lindsay Eager says, this isn't a book with huge stakes. There's no imperative to save the world. This is not a book about a chosen one. It's a book about a chosen family. It's not about life or death. It's about bread, the stuff of life. So for ages 10 to 14, it'll be coming out in May. So you won't wanna miss it. 
Then next we have uh, Ment. Oops, sorry, <laughs> I stepped in too fast. <laughs> Forgot to mention. Also, don't want to miss um, coming out in paperback next year as well. The Bigfoot Files, and also, of course, don't forget her other titles that are also in paperback. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no, sorry about that. Such a huge fan of Lindsay Eager. So excited about that title. Okay, next we have Meant to Be by award-winning middle grade author Joe Knowles. In this sequel to Where the Heart Is, which was an ALA notable selection with great starred reviews, the lens turns to younger sister Ivy. Ivy loves living in Applewood Heights. The family's apartment is tiny and her older sister Rachel won't stop grumbling about sharing a room after their old house was lost to foreclosure. But for the first time, Ivy has friends. Lucas and Alice lives close, lives close by and every week, all three watch their favorite cooking show and practice baking together, even if Ivy has to find creative substitutes for the pricey ingredients. But Ivy is a warrior, and this summer, there's plenty to be anxious about. Her parents can't wait to move to a bigger place, which is the last thing Ivy wants. Then Alice receives devastating news, and Ivy somehow manages to say just the wrong thing. Will Alice ever stop being mad at her? Joe Knowles puts quirky, tenacious nine-year-old Ivy in the spotlight as she tries to figure out exactly where she's meant to be. This book addresses issues of financial instability and the anxiety that may result in difficult circumstances surrounding it uh, with great compassion and sensitivity, which is what Joel Knowles always does so well in her stories. It's coming out next March for ages nine to 12, meant to be. And then next we have The Lucky Ones, by Linda Williams Jack. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that, that, that slide of just a little note about the first book of the companion piece, Where the Heart Is. Um, please check that one out too. And also wanted to let you know, Joe Knowles did a little cover reveal of Meant to Be just right before this preview, which is exciting. So be sure to follow her on Twitter. It's always nice to see an author reveal the cover. It's a great moment. Okay, so next, The Lucky Ones by Linda Williams Jackson, who's the author of Midnight Without a Moon, which is an ALO notable selection and a Jane Addams honor book for peace and social justice. Her second book, A Sky Full of Stars, received a Malta Penn honor for an outstanding children's book addressing human rights issues and was also Bank Street College best book of the year. In The Lucky Ones, Jackson pulls from her own childhood in the Mississippi Delta to tell the story of Ellis Earl, who dreams for a real house food enough for the whole family and to be somebody. It's 1967 and 11-year-old Alice Earl wants to grow up to be a teacher or a lawyer or maybe both so that he can get his family out of poverty. And so he applies himself at school, soaking up the lessons, particularly those about famous people of color like Mr. Thurgood Marshall and Ms. Marion Wright and borrowing books from his teacher's bookshelf. When Mr. Foster uh, presents him with a copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, he is delighted that the Buckets very happy ending um, happened despite their financial misfortunes. But when mama tells Ellis Earl that he might need to quit school to provide for the family, he wonders if happy endings are only possible in storybooks. This is set around the historical touchdown of Robert Kennedy's Southern Poverty Tour. And it's a poignant story about the life-changing power of good books, good teachers, and good people. A good comp title will be The Watsons Go to Birmingham. The Lucky Ones is coming out next April for ages 8 to 12. Awesome. So next is an exciting new title from our MIT Press, The Han Moji Handbook, Your Guide to the Chinese Language Through Emoji. Yes, you heard that right. Um, even though their dates of origin are millennia apart, the languages of Chinese and emoji share similarities that you might find surprising. These Hanmoji parallels offer an exciting new way to learn Chinese and a fascinating window into the evolution of Chinese Han characters. Packed with fun illustrations and engaging descriptions, the Hanmoji Handbook brings to life the ongoing dialogue between the visual elements of Chinese characters and the language of emoji. And just a little bit more about our amazing authors on this book. Um, Jennifer Aitley is a vice chair of the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee and co-founder of Emojination, a grassroots group that advocates for more inclusive and representative emoji. She is also a former New York Times reporter and author of the Fortune Cookie Chronicles and producer of the documentaries, The Search for General So and The Emoji Story, meaning she's very qualified to talk about emojis and everything in this book. Um, and then 
Next, we have Ann Xiaomina, who's a technologist, writer, and artist whose work has been featured in the New York Times, The Economist, The Atlantic, and Hyperallergic. And Jason Lee is an independent designer, artist, and educator. His practice revolves around promulgating bottom-up narratives, exploring network technology, and helping people live safely on the internet, which is, of course, so important. Um, at once entertaining and educational, this unique volume holds sure appeal for readers who use emojis and anyone interested in learning Chinese, plus just those who love quirky visual gift books. Um, I know I am so excited for this book because I just think it's such a fascinating topic, um, so you won't want to miss that. And last but not least, we have The Gifts That Bind Us by Carolyn O'Donohue, which is a YA um, and the spellbinding sequel to All Our Hidden Gifts, one of the most buzzed about YA novels of 2021. In this sequel, it brilliantly expands the world of the first book, introducing new characters in a wider supernatural world filled with witches and magical thievery. It's senior year and Maeve and her friends are practicing and strengthening their mystical powers, but Maeve is worried about what the future holds for all of them. Soon alarm bells sound for the coven when the children of Bridget, a, a right-wing religious organization, quickly gains influence throughout the city. And when its charismatic frontman starts visiting Maeve in her dreams, then Maeve's power starts to wane and the friends realize that all the local magic is being stolen. With lines increasingly blurred between friend and foe, the supernatural and the psychological, Maeve and the others must band together to protect the place and the people they love. Um, all Our Hidden Gifts received four starred reviews and its sequel just keeps the excitement going. So you don't wanna miss either of these books. Um, the paperback will be coming out um, too. And Carolyn O'Donoghue is, of course, an Irish author, journalist, and host of the acclaimed podcast, Sentimental Garbage. Really excited about that. Um, thanks, Dana. So we also now wanted to quickly point out a few more titles to note from Spring 22. We have the first book of a series based on the New York Times bestselling middle grade series by Liz Kessler, The World of Emily Winstap, now for younger readers. And then next we have the sixth title in the infamous Ratzos series. Um, the first title of which was awarded a Geisel honor. So this will be perfect for summer reading um, and it'll come out right in time for that. And then next we have uh, the third and the final installment in the Chronicles of Zombert from award-winning creators, Cara LaRoe, who's also the author of Infamous Ratzos and Ryan Andrews brings a series of a, a, to a heart pounding and completely satisfying close. And then next we have author Dina Nayeri, a former child refugee herself, tackles younger nonfiction for the first time in The Waiting Place. Her recent fiction and nonfiction for adults have also centered around the theme of refugees, including The Ungrateful Refugee, which was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and the LA, LA Times Book Prize. And then lastly, we also have in paperback, Trowbridge Road, a 2020 National Book Award long uh, list, long list selection by Marcella Pixley. Newbery medalist, Avi's historical adventure, Gold Rush Girl, and the popular YA fantasy, The Mermaid, the Witch and the Sea by Maggie Takuda Hall. These will all be available next spring in paperback, perfect for summer book club picks or virtual book club picks for older readers. So stay tuned. Yes. And finally, I also want to talk about some of our Walker Books US books. Um, Loki is written by Louis Stoll. It's a diary packed with doodles and cartoons of Loki as he's trapped on Earth as a petulant 11 year old dealing with the trials of middle school. And even worse, annoying Thunder God Thor is there too. So, of course, for anyone who is a Marvel fan, a Loki fan, they won't want to miss this really fun new book. Um, also, The Pear Affair, um, written by the author of The Secret Starling. It's a similar similar vein. It's a charming, thrilling middle grade caper set in 1960s Paris from uh, Judith Eagle, who has mastered the mid 20th century historical mystery novel. Um, so you definitely want to check both of those out. Oops, sorry. <laughs> went too fast. Um, so also by Louis Stoll, this is the third book in the Kit the Wizard series. Kit and her friends face not only a new school year, but big questions about ethical uses of magic and the importance of letting people make their own decisions. So you want to make sure you read the whole Kit the Wizard series. They're so fun. And 
Also, don't miss the newest book in the Jasmine Green series, uh, Jasmine Green Rescue series, which is perfect for animal lovers. And of course, we have so many adorable books in that series that you also won't want to miss. It's such a cute series. I'm so excited about that title. Okay, so now it's time to move on to our closing speaker of the day, Christina Suntornbat. So I had the pleasure of first meeting Christina at SLJ Day of Dialogue in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right in our neck of the woods when she was promoting a wish in the dark back in 2019. This was of course before the days of COVID. So we got to also invite her to our little cafe in our office for our in-person librarian preview event. and. Um, it was just so wonderful to see her there. We all just knew that this was a very special book from the get-go. And then cut to spring of 2021, we are now also promoting this fabulous new nonfiction title by her, all 13, the incredible cave rescue of the Thai boys soccer team remotely. And though we didn't get to see each other in person again uh, at that time, it became very clear that these titles were reaching the hearts of so many readers out there both titles eventually receiving the 2021 Newbery Honors. It was a historic win. All 13 also ended up receiving a Cyber Honor and numerous no other nonfiction awards. It's also a Kirkus Prize finalist and a uh, Boston Globe Porn Book Awards Honor book. The list just goes on. And then also, did you know that her picture book, The Blunders, A Cat Counting Catastrophe, came out in the same year as the other two titles? She really truly can do it all. Um, and Christine is also the author of numerous other children's books, including the Rambo Shamble Children, il illustrated by Caldica honoree Lauren Castillo, and the beloved Diary of an Ice Princess chapter book series. Today, we get to hear about her much anticipated new middle grade novel, The Last Map Maker. It's a thought provoking examination of wealth and class, colonialism and environmentalism, and personal responsibility, all set in a totally original. Thai fantasy world. It'll be coming out next April for ages 8 to 12. We can't wait to hear all about it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christina, and take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Sawako. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you today um, and so happy to be talking about The Last Map Maker. I loved hearing about all of those books. I'm so excited about so many of them, um, especially Revolution in Our Time was one of the best nonfiction books I read. I got to read an early copy of it by Kekla Magoon, and it's just incredible. And I'm so Excited about Nancy's historical fiction. It just sounds so great. I love that I got to hear a little sneak preview of that. So, so yes, let me tell you about The Last Map Maker. You know, I was going to say, you know, brag about how long I had been working on this because I started working on it in 2014. But then Nancy said she had been working on Healer and Witch for 25 years. So I guess that kind of stole my thunder, Nancy. <laughs> Um, yeah, Last Map Maker has been in my heart for a long time. It took a long while to figure it out and get it right. So uh, I'm thrilled to be presenting it. Um, briefly, what the story is about. Uh, this follows a young girl named Sai. Sai is an apprentice to a map maker, the most famous map maker in her kingdom. And from the outside, she has it all together. She has, uh, she's a very respectable young lady really she's hiding a big secret she comes from a criminal family so her father is a con man and she often gets roped into his cons and she really hates that she really wants to escape that life in the world that she lives in your family your lineage your legacy you, you know your your who you're descended from your ancestors all determine your fate so she kind of doesn't have a lot to look forward to but then one day, uh, her her employer, the map maker, gets an invitation to go on an expedition to discover uh, an unknown continent, and she leaps at the chance to join him. So she gets on board this ship on this amazing expedition, and you know this is her chance to change her future, to make her fortune. But she soon realizes that everyone on board the ship, and I mean every single person is hiding secrets, not just her. And so she's got to like figure out what's going on. She has to figure out what is she willing to uh, risk? What's she willing to do to go after her big dreams? Um, 
And I'll tell you a little uh, uh, more about the inspiration behind the book. So um, Dana, we can go to the next slide. So this, uh, you know, it's hard to remember because I started working on it so long ago, um, exactly how it came to me. But I, I, I know that maps and my love of maps are probably where I started, why I started writing the story in the first place, you know. I know so many of you probably agree with me that you just love to look at maps and stare at especially old maps. Um, I think that maps really tell a story. They don't just tell a story about like the place that's on the paper, but they tell you a lot about the person who drew the map itself and the world that they lived in, the worldview that they had. Um, we have a book of old maps and it talks about like the history of cartography and um, Dana, you can go to the next slide. Um, it's just fascinating to me how, uh, you know, you, you go back centuries when people had much um, less refined technology, but they're still exploring the world. And you can see how, you know, where where they centered the map, which parts are bigger, which parts are smaller, tells a lot about the way they viewed the world, which parts are dark and shaded, which, you know, where did people just completely make things up? Because that happened a lot with map making. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's all of those wonderful old maps that have monsters and sea dragons floating around in them and and so if you're a lover of fantasy fiction like i am you cannot help but be intrigued by maps and start making up your own stories about them right so another big source of inspiration for this story uh is the british uh, gold, like golden age of exploration so in the next slide this is a picture of admiral john barrow and um so in Britain, after the Napoleonic Wars, which Britain won, they they so the Napoleonic Wars were these huge uh, was a huge war fought mostly on the sea, and so after the war was over, Britain had all of these huge expensive warships. They had all of these officers, these well trained. Um, naval officers, and they had all of this money, and they were like, what are we going to do? <laughs> so they ended up sending their ships out. They decided, well, we're going to just go and explore the world and use our resources to claim all of this land and make these discoveries in the name of Britain. And um, so they sent their ships out, uh, you know, to the Arctic, to the North Pole, to the South Pole, um, into Africa. They searched for a Northwest Passage across North America. Um, of course, every place that they were discovering, except for maybe Antarctica, already had people there. Like it is kind of amazing to go back and read the journals of these explorers talking about how they're making these amazing discoveries, but they're talking about people who are already living there in their journals. So of course they are not the first people there, but you wouldn't know that from reading those journals. So um, so the last map maker draws on that a lot. And um, you know, one of the themes in, in the book is, imperialism, the arrogance of colonialism, and sort of just the, the reverberations, the echoes that war has uh, and that empire has um, all, all across the globe. Um, and uh, let's see, next slide. What are some other inspirations for this book? Oh, yes. So um, most of the book takes place on the open sea, uh, like three quarters of the book is on a ship. And I, I love the ocean. Um, I love being on boats. I love being at the beach. I love the water so much. It's really sad that I live in Texas and I am landlocked. Like nothing is more heartbreaking for me. <laughs> but um, in a book that's talking about secrets, about you know having to like confront who you are and like face up to your darkest, the darkest parts of your personality, I just felt like the sea was the perfect place for it. The sea is beautiful. It's uh, enchanting. It is also brutal. It's unforgiving. You cannot hide. There's nowhere to hide out there. So it's just like perfect setting. I just loved writing the scenes in the ocean. Um, a couple more slides. Uh, I would say that um, if I could, you know, point to any books that were real big inspirations for this story, gotta be true Confessions of Charlotte Doyle. This is one of my favorite novels growing up. In fact, in middle school, I remember, this is embarrassing, I really can't believe I'm sharing this. 
Um, I wrote the name of the boy that I had a crush on and I put, I tucked it into the true confessions of Charlotte Doyle. Um, that is how much I love that book and how much I felt like that was my book, like my story. Um, other influence, probably Great Expectations uh, by Charles Dickens, just like the idea of having ambition and about just being a young person who kind of is maybe figuring out like what your what your family means what your background means and how much you're a part of them, even if you wish that you weren't. Um, and all of the the legacy that our family gives to us and finally one thing that you have to know about this story is that there is a dragon. <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out a better way to pitch that more than like there is a dragon, but um, there are definitely those those sea monsters, those dragons that you see on those maps lurking in the islands. Uh, there, there is one also in this story swimming beneath the waves of this ship. Okay, so that is all about the book and some background. I think I'm going to read a short passage. I'm just going to read the first chapter. And, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions. So chapter one is a golden morning. I must have looked like all the other assistants standing in line for breakfast that morning at the Three Onions Cafe. We all wore the same starched white shirts, gray trousers, and stiff black cotton aprons with dip, deep pockets. The assistants uniform was meant to put each of us on the same level, making us equals for the one year we would spend in service. What a joke. We may have worn the same clothes, but it was still clear as glass where we stood. We knew without asking who among us had carriages and who had to walk, whose mothers held important positions on this or that council, which of us had maids and which ones had to clean out their own bed pots. No one ever said anything, but we knew. I lingered at the back of the line, doing my impression of the shy girl, feet tilted inward, head tipped down, looking like someone who had nothing to add to the conversation. You could learn more about people if they didn't think you were worth talking to. And I had a whole list of other details I needed to pay close attention to if I was going to play along with them. Hair, combed free of lice and braided lovingly by my mother, or even better, my maid. Fingernails cleaned out and filed. Shoes, the right kind, purchased from the right shop, shined and with nothing icky sticking to the soles. Spine, held straight as if I were proud of where I came from and had a bright future to look forward to. Grumble. I coughed to mask the sound of my growling stomach. A full belly was the one thing I couldn't fake and coming to the three onions in the morning only made the grumbling worse. The steam in the wood paneled restaurant smelled of fresh oysters, chopped garlic and green herbs. It took real effort not to stick out my tongue and lick the air. Something felt different from other mornings though. The kids in line were more chatty than usual. A tall assistant leaned her elbow on the counter while the others pressed in close, hanging on her words. I called her Tippy because of the way she tipped her head back to look down at the rest of us. I didn't know much about her except that she worked for a master pastry chef near the Temple Square. Tippy had always been popular and pretty, but that morning she was glowing. She laughed and smoothed her long braid over her shoulder. The light from the cafe windows bounced off something golden and shiny at her wrist. So that was it, a lineal. A pang of jealousy worked its way into my empty stomach. She must have turned 13 the day before. The other assistants pushed in closer to gape at Tippy's gold bracelet. Hold it up so we can all see, said one of them. Oh, it's so pretty. The others oohed and awed as Tippy held up her wrist and gave the bracelet a little jangle. How many links is that? Five, asked another girl, unable to hide the envy in her voice. That spring, she had been the first among us to get her lineal. She touched it now self-consciously, four golden loops hanging from a brooch pinned to her blouse. Tippy answered a little too loudly. Actually, it's seven. Everyone murmured and pressed in closer to count the golden rings of her bracelet for themselves. Each link in a lineal represented one generation of ancestors, ancestors whose names you knew, ones you were proud to claim. In my mind, I let out a snort. With a background that fine, what was she doing as a baker's assistant? Suddenly, I realized that all the eyes in the cafe had turned to me. Tripe. At least I thought I'd snorted in my mind. Tippy narrowed her eyes at me. You, at the back of the line, what's your name? 
Order 49, shouted a shrill voice behind the counter. Thank the heavens. I squeezed past the girls to get to the counter, then bowed to Mrs. Noom and took the container of porridge from her. Thank you, ma'am, I said in the meekest version of my shy girl voice. I had better be going, I'm already late. I could feel the other assistants' eyes on me as I passed. I knew they were sizing me up. They couldn't look down their noses at me until they figured out which rung of the ladder I stood on. And what if they knew the truth, that I wasn't even on the ladder, that in a few months when I turned 13, there wouldn't be so much as a cake crumb, let alone a lineal celebration. I had no proud family line, no noble ancestors. There was exactly one link to my past and it certainly wasn't made of gold. If they knew the truth, they would think I was nothing. And who could blame them? That's the first time I have read that to anyone except myself. Well, <laughs> so I am hooked. <laughs> yeah, so am I. That's a fabulous <laughs> reading, Christina. Thank you. It's surprising that that was the first time that you've done that because it was so great. Um, and you had all the right voices that I, when I was reading it, I was like, oh, I bet this, they sound like this. You had that down. So that was so cool oh, to hear you, you actually thank read. You. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you for that fantastic look inside this brand new adventure from you. You know, um, I never really considered it, but this book really makes you wander the adventure hidden behind the actual map making. Um, and yeah, just, I just hooked from the very first chapter. You really want to root for Sai, the protagonist, to get out into the big wide ocean and go on this adventure and discover herself and her potential and all the peripheral characters she meets along the way are incredibly, like they're so unforgettable. And of course, the extraordinary world building that went into this story is just amazing. So thank you for this book. And I, as you were saying, like the Charlotte Doyle and the Great Expectation and the Ghibli Dragon, they're all in there. I can see that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was so cool. So now we're gonna open up the floors for a few minutes of Q and A. Um, I already see you guys sending a lot of great questions. So thanks so much. Um, so Christina, Summer asked, were you able to spend much time on the ocean, open ocean to do research? Um, I mean, I didn't do that specifically for this book. Um, I probably the most time I ever spent on the ocean was um, when I was in college, I studied abroad in Australia. And I one of my friends was a diving instructor. And she got me all like this. Uh, somehow I got this ability to like, go with her on these um, on these boat trips that would go out to the Great Barrier Reef. And and do these diving trips and so we spent a lot of time out on this boat and she also had like a boat license and we would like go out on this boat together um and so that was probably the most time i ever spent on the open sea was with her she was amazing um but yeah nothing specifically for this book um wow. lot, lots of ship lots of uh ship <laughs> research for this book for sure <laughs> sailing wow. ship research. Well, yeah, that sounds amazing and a great experience also. I'm sure that went into a little bit of the, the, the inspiration behind it. Um, uh, is there a particular Thai mythology fable that you pulled from this last map maker? Summer asked the Zen, and, or are you pulling more from Thai history? P.S. Thank you for the dragon. Oh, yay. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of dragons, um, the type of dragon that's in this story is very much a Southeast Asian style dragon. So in Thai mythology um, and, you know, in par as part of their re religious iconography too, the Naga, the water serpent is, is featured heavily. So it's not um, a dragon, like the a Western dragon with like wings, like a big, um, like a big reptilian, I guess it is reptilian, it's a snake, but it's not, it's not like the same as like a Western style dragon. So it doesn't have wings, um, has very like, uh, a, a lot of the Naga, a lot of the Thai Naga don't have legs either. They're more like a, a snake, like a water serpent. So that was what was in my mind um, as I was thinking about this. So beyond that, no specific fable, though there are Naga a lot in, in Thai fables, uh, in so many stories. Wow. Great question. 
Yeah, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then next we have Sonia asking, who are writers and creatives that have influenced your writing craft? Oh my gosh, I mean, so many. Um, one of the authors that, uh, Sawako, that you were presenting is Lindsay Eaker. Um, mm -hmm. And she's like one of my favorites. I just think she's so just original. I love her voice. Race to the Bottom of the Sea is one of my favorite middle grades. I just mm -hmm. love that story so much. Um, I, I mean, just like too many, I feel like. <laughs> I feel like this is like catching me off guard because I feel like I, I learn from every single book I pick up, every author mm -hmm. that I read and pick up. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. that's true. No, that's a good that's a good answer. I think every single book out there <laughs> that you've read. So I love that. Um, and Lindsay Eager, yeah, she's a fantastic um, writer, and I can see how yeah the ocean adventure um, connection there too. Um, Okay, so Beth asks, yes, wonderful reading. I look forward to the whole story. What Thai influences did you incorporate? Um, there is, so the idea that the world, in, in, the, in the world, you know, there are these tangible, um, oh, look, I, I wore my gold links for this, <laughs> for this presentation. <laughs> Um, the, so I, I made up the idea of there being a lineal, like um, a piece of jewelry that you wear to show um, tangibly, like, you know, you can count the generations of your good breeding. Um, in Thai culture, I would say that, you know, your, your status, your family name, your, you know, your social, the social hierarchy, all of that is you know, a pretty big part of life over there, um, which like, I don't come from that at all. <laughs> um, and so, so all of that, like that part of the culture went into the story of uh, the customs, you know, there throughout the story, you see her, you know, like bowing to her elders. That's a big part of it. Like how she addresses um, people and how they address each other, like the societal customs that all draws from from Thai culture for sure. It was say it was very definitely if you read a wish in the dark, the last map maker, the world building is less tightly tied to Thailand than a wish in the dark is. Um, but still like that influence is all there. Oh, the food also food and names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the names are so fun. There's so uh, many names in there. <laughs> yeah, the names are very Thai. Mm. That makes sense. Um, okay, so we're gonna take, this is the last question from Carrie Henry. Um, thank you, Carrie. Uh, you're so talented to have written fiction, picture books and nonfiction. Do you have a favorite? Oh gosh, I mean, I think fantasy fiction is always going to be my favorite. Um, that's what I love to read as a young reader. You know, I loved hearing Nancy say, like what she hopes for her book is that kids are entertained like that, I hope that too. And I feel like, um, you know, that that's what I was seeking so much with the books that I was reading as a young person. I just wanted to be completely swept away, swept up, taken out of my reality for a little while and just like live in a dream that this author had created. Um, and that's what middle grade fantasy did for me. So I feel like that's always probably gonna be my my heart spot, like where where my heart goes when I'm looking at a new project. Um, mm -hmm. It was just so important to me as a young person. Well, that was great. Thank you. I think that was a great way to end the Q and A. <laughs> great note. <laughs> thank you guys for asking all thank those you questions. So much. And, and yes, thank you, Christina. We're sending you a big round of applause your way. Um, it was such a treat to be able to hear about your brand new work. And everyone, make sure to check out the last map maker coming out next April. You can request the eGalley on Edelweiss. All right. I can't believe it, but it looks like it's time to already wrap up this preview when you're you know having fun it's hard to keep track of time but if you're still here with us nancy please join us to say goodbye together um and christina oh uh do we lose you feel free to come back sorry <laughs> <laughs> we're just gonna say goodbye <laughs> together <laughs> this is our way of saying goodbye i think it's um it's fun to do so so this concludes our spring 22 librarian preview series 
if you missed the picture book preview, feel free to reach out to me or library at campbellwood.com. And I'd be happy to send you a link to the archive recording of it uh, when it becomes available. The recording of this preview will also be available soon and will be sent along to anyone who's registered for the event. And make sure to take your uh, virtual goodie bag on your way out. Um, it should pop right up on your browser after you log off. But if you don't get it, not to worry, you will We'll send it to you in an email uh, following this event. It's a link to all of our available digital resources and the slides from today's preview. So yeah, thank mm -hmm. you again all for tuning in today. Uh, we hope you stay safe out there wherever you are, hopefully with a good book. And uh, yeah, happy reading. And we look forward to seeing you uh, again at our next event. Bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you.